www.enrc.com. EWTN. Live Truth. Live Catholic. Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, hi. Here it is, Tuesday. And we have the, uh, a lot of wonderful things happening. Well, some are not too wonderful. In fact, some are downright terrible. But I thought tonight we'd have a kind of smorgasbord. Do you ever have smorgasbord? <laughs> yes? Do you like smorgasbord? Yes. Well, tonight I thought we'd have a smorgasbord. Um, I thought we'd talk a little bit, a, a bit about a developing an informed conscience. And the kids are going back to school. They have a lot of temptations, a lot of things that come their way at their age that shouldn't. Because huh? if, if your knowledge of God and love of God doesn't form your conscience, you can have one messy conscience. If it doesn't tell you what's right and wrong, how would you form a conscience and how would you make a decision? If you began to drive a car and nobody told you that there is a red light, a yellow light, and a green light. Now, you could take your choice and you'd say, ah, oh, I have three colors. <laughs> I don't like red. <laughs> I think I'll stop at green. You're going to find your head through the windshield. Now, you, what formed your conscience to say, I, I better stop? What formed that? What, what made your conscience think, buddy, I would stop right here if I were you. Somebody told you a red light is for stop. A green light is for go. I have never figured out what the yellow light is. <laughs> I think it means slow down or you're in trouble. <laughs> I never thought. I never figured out. But anyway, I don't drive, so it doesn't matter what I think about it. Oh, but that's the point, isn't it, huh? The fact that I don't drive, I don't have a formed conscience about red, yellow, and green lights. When sister stops, I thought, well, it's time to stop. And before I could see color, that much of it anyway, I didn't know what was on. Yeah, orange, yellow, green, pink, I didn't know. But somebody had to tell me. By some means. If I couldn't see the color, they say the light on top is red, the light in the middle is yellow, and the light on the bottom is green. Now, can you see it goes on and up? Yeah. Okay. This is how you tell. 
So I form my conscience as to whether I'm going to stop, rush through, <laughs> see if I can make it. Everybody has that temptation. There's that yellow light. <laughs> Off I go. If it turns red on, on top of the car, it doesn't matter. What's the matter with the rest of you? Can't see. I'm under the light. <laughs> but that's our mentality, see? I figured that out without even seeing the color. I thought to myself one day, what is it that makes everybody turn the gas on when the middle light goes on? <laughs> See? So somehow your conscience is formed by the world. If that's all you have, if you've never heard of God or never heard of salvation, never heard of Jesus, never heard of the Father, never heard he loves you, never heard that he created you, never heard there is a transcendent being greater than anything created that loves you. Well, if you never heard that, then what standard do you judge things by? We're conscious, what it is formed by. See? If you lived in a ghetto and all you know was misery, then that's all you know. See? It's an amazing thing about our conscience. If it's not enlightened and well-formed by truth, truth, see? Then, it can do about anything and thinking it's right. See, I told you the time that Sister and I got on the plane, there were two places to go because there were two different planes. We turned the corner. And so we, uh, we got on the plane and we started to eat. And now you're up there quite a bit before they feed you. But anyway, we get up there and the pilot gets on, says this little thing, ladies and gentlemen, we're very happy you're here. He has to be, he wouldn't get his salary next month, you <laughs> see, so I wasn't sure his, his happiness was that sincere. However, he said, we will arrive in Miami in an hour and a half. <laughs> Miami? <laughs> I said, uh, sister, did he say Miami? <laughs> she said, yes. I said, we're not going to Miami. <laughs> she said, uh, we are now, mother. <laughs> so I called the stewardess and I said, uh, did I misunderstand the captain? Are we going to Miami? And she said, oh yes. Oh, she said, you're not going to Miami? I said, I am now. <laughs> now, we were wrong. Wrong time, wrong place, wrong direction. We were sincerely wrong. We got on that plane thinking it was some other city. Well, it took us about twice the amount of time to get there. I could have gone to Europe. <laughs> but the point is, you can't always go by a conscience that's not formed by truth. <sighs> if we're only going to go by our conscience, then you can do about anything. You know how the church has talked about contraception and abortion. There is a mass movement, not in a country, but the whole world, for disobedience. And they blame it on their conscience. See, the conscience seems to be that one thing that allows you to do what you want. If a man murders a man, another man, he says, well, I, I, that's how I feel. He ought to, he ought to go. I know conscience is a very delicate thing. 
But you can't deny, if you look at the papers and look at the world, you must not believe that God is creator. Because it's like looking at a painting of Michelangelo. First you deny Michelangelo painted it. And then you want to take part of it out because you think it looked better. You insult the painter. When somebody took a hammer and, and, cut, and knocked the hand off of the Pieta, that masterpiece of Our Lady holding Our Lord, they had to put the whole thing behind glass. Now when you go to the Basilica, it's all under glass. Somebody's conscience said this statue has to go. It is the duty of the church under God to tell us truth. You see, if Jesus went through all of this, I'm going to take it up. If Jesus went through all of this for you, for me, the Father is bound in justice, see? Bound in justice to provide for us a vehicle of truth. See? If he went this far, we should might not believe that. <laughs> Sweetheart, it don't matter <laughs> what you believe. It's the truth. You go by truth. You can't go by what some person believes. You gotta know who has taught that person and what is that person teaching you? What is that man or woman teaching you? If that teaching you truth, then you're on a, you're on the wrong way. And the truth is that he did come, he did rise, he did die and rise to the dead for me and you. He is bound by justice to give me the truth and a vehicle of truth. He's not going to write the truth in the sky like one of these airplanes, you know, sail at Bemberger's. He's not going to say, here's the truth of the month, everybody. He has to give me a vehicle of truth. And that's the church. Now, if you have 20 ideas about one thing, what, 19 of them are wrong. Or maybe all 20 are wrong. Then where is the truth? See, some people don't even ask today, what is the truth? You can talk to 20 people, they all have something else to say. But then does your conscience say which one is right? Why would you want to go your whole life believing a lie? That don't make sense to me. Does that make sense to you? Make any sense at all? See, I, I want to know what is God asking of me? If you buy, I've said this a hundred times, I'll say it a hundred more. If you buy a car, you got a whole pack of instruction. Put vinegar in your tank instead of gasoline. See what happens. Now you could say, I bought a car and I want to put gas, I want to put vinegar in my car. Why doesn't it run? I think if you went to the, uh, the local uh, car dealership, you'd say, well, you can't run it by vinegar. Why not? Look, I didn't make the car, I only sell them. They don't run that way. Now you can stand there, you can stomp your feet. But your foot on that accelerator, still choke. <laughs> it just won't run on vinegar, even apple cider vinegar. <laughs> or wine vinegar, it won't run. <laughs> now, do you think, though, that's kind of a silly example? But it's not for the simple reason that a lot of people judge their eternity that way. Professor so-and-so said there is no God. 
Oh boy, what a man, I mean, you know. Smart, huh? You know, that happened to somebody. And so this man said, well, he, had, he was going to bring his watch to a, to a jeweler because it was all, his son dropped it and was all over the floor. So he picked up everything. I'm going to bring it to the jeweler. And this professor was telling him, there is no God. So he said, oh, I'm glad to know that. I always thought there was. So he thought he had won a victory. So the man puts his hand in his pocket and he takes out this box that's full of little springs and everything. He said, my son uh, dropped this this morning, my watch, and it's kind of in pieces. He said, oh, yeah. Amazing how many pieces make a watch. Oh, yeah. He said, if I put this in a box and I bury it, would it all go together in, say, a hundred years if I were alive? He said, what, are you crazy? Can't go together by itself. Really? You mean all these little springs and all these little screws, if I put them in a box and bury them for a hundred years, when I go get the box, it won't be a beautiful watch again? He says, of course not. Oh. Then you look at the stars and the moon and the sea and the fishes and man with intelligence, and you tell me it just all went together by itself. Now, if you were told that, uh, and that's all you were ever told, you might believe it, but you'd be wrong, see? You'd be wrong. Uh, see, deep within a conscience, yours and mine, everybody, man discovers a law, uh, which he doesn't lay upon himself. But you got to obey it. You know, the, the pygmies in Africa, the, the people in South America, way out there in the jungle, they all have a law. They all have a law. And they maybe have never heard of God, but there is a law among them of right and wrong. And they got to obey that. You and I, in our conscience, planted by God himself, this is wrong and this is right. Even if you don't know this awesome catechism. I bet you when Satan was in the, the age of, you know, Lucifer, the great light, when he was arguing with God about redemption, that uh, the, the incarnation, that the second person would become man, I wouldn't be surprised if he said something like this. Well, now, let's see here, Lord God. I think you're wrong. I think the Son of Man, the eternal Word, should not become a mere human being, half spirit and half animal, but take on angelic nature. At least it's a higher nature. I think you're wrong. I think that's when uh, a third of the angels fell because they all were convinced somewhere along the line, yeah, he's right. The eternal word should take on our nature, not human nature. They're bulky, they're stupid, it takes them years to learn anything. They only walk 12 inches at a time. 14 if you got big feet. <laughs> We travel with the speed of thought. And he's going to become one of them. Isn't that logical? Isn't that logical? 
some of us ought to be mighty happy we weren't among them. We might have thought that was very logical. Till Michael came along and he said, who is like unto God? God can do as he pleases. Today, in this beautiful world that God created for our good, it seems like the more he gives, the more we rebel. We say, I will not serve. Did you notice that when, when, there's a ba when there's someone to save, be it ever so young, they call it a baby. They call it even a boy and a girl. When they want to get rid of it, it they call it it or a fetus. Isn't that strange how they manipulate language? I got a letter from a woman who uh, had an abortion. And this is my question of the week. She had an abortion. She was 16. Almost died. What she said to me was, uh, they injected saline solution, and for two hours she could feel the baby dying and struggling for life. She was told it was just a fetus, no problem. Then she went into labor and delivered a burned child, almost black. And they had the gall to ask her, well, do you want to know what it is, the boy or girl? She knew, she said yes. She knew to live with that. She said, I don't want to know. And she saw that baby in pieces. There was a doctor not too long ago who got kind of a much applause because he goes to the abortion clinic with the guards, with police. And that very doctor killed a 12-year-old girl on that abortion table. She began to vomit. And he put down her throat a 54 cent tube, plastic tube, and she started to vomit anyway, and she went into a coma, and for three weeks she was in a coma and she died. <clears throat> Nothing was done. Nothing. When he was asked, didn't you know she was 12 years old? He said, oh yeah, we get a lot of those. Those. We even get 10-year-olds, he said. Well, somehow, when I think of that and hear the statement I heard this afternoon or yesterday, uh, that we're being terribly selfish. We're being awesomely selfish by fighting abortion. So it means that anybody's conscience is more important as unenlightened as it may be, is more important than a baby torn apart and burned black. We live in a mixed up world, mixed up. So, You see what happens, my friends, when your conscience is not enlightened or informed. I want to say something to this woman tonight, and to many of you listening. Your conscience at that moment was not formed. 
your conscience because people told you it was not a baby. They told you it was just a fetus. They told you you have a right to a career. You have a right to have a good time before you start having children, before you're tied down. You have your rights. That's what you were told. You believed that. You believed it. And nobody came to you after to ease your mind or your heart. You see, I tell you, you told me you went to confession and you were forgiven. And you know that. What a wonderful thing that was. But who gave it to you? The church. I want to tell the woman tonight that your church is a mother. Unlike the people who forced you into this, she understands where you were. She forgave you through the power of the sacraments. She forgave you, and you were able to receive Jesus in your heart. And when you wake up at night with that scene in front of your face, that Savior comes also to your mind and says, come to me. I have forgiven you. I love you. I came that you may live even after such a sin. I love you. Do not despair. That's the same God that is saying to everybody, this is wrong. Be at peace. You have received the sacrament that he died to give you. You have received his precious blood, his body. You have received grace and forgiveness and mercy. Rejoice. Go and sin no more. That is what <coughs> that very church who is saying what nobody wants to hear is the only church that can give you peace after you commit such a crime. <sighs> So you see, my friends, never despair. Though your sins are as scarlet, that wondrous sacrament will make that your soul beautifully white again. And so I say to the woman who wrote me that beautiful letter, who is more than repented, who has given the Lord three new children from her heart. Pray to the little one. Pray to him or her. And say, I'm sorry. I love you. And the very church that speaks today so clearly through our Holy Father is the one who received that burned child as a martyr. Jesus took that child and brought him to his kingdom, pure and clean. How much good God brings out of every evil we do. I would ask now that I think that you've gone to confession, do not fear, and do not worry. Encourage others not to have abortions. Tell them the side they won't tell. It's a mission. It's a work, a wonderful work. Now you know. See? But that Lord who loves you so much 
forgives and forgets. Don't question or doubt that infinite mercy. Don't question it. Just breathe it in and absorb it. That's why he died. We have a call. Hello? Uh, yes, Sister Angelica? Yeah. Yes, um, I was listening to your program. Can you and, speak a little louder, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I was listening to your program on abortion, and I would just like to share with you and, and with the audience that for any young women out there that are contemplating such a horrible, horrible thing, um, to really give some second thought to it. And I do speak from personal experience. Um, 25 years ago when I thought that, you know, there was some tragedy going on in my life, and I really did not believe I was going to be able to care for the child. I was convinced that this is what I should do. And I can honestly tell you that there has not been a year that's gone by since that time that I have not thought of that child. And if anyone feels that they're that devastated of what's going on in their personal life, if they would just step outside of what is going on in their immediate life as far as worldly issues and put their faith and trust in God and pray to Him, He, he will guide them. He will direct them. And when we least expect it, and I do speak from personal experience, yes. by us having faith in Him, He will send us that, that guidance and that help. But we have to step outside of what's going on in the world today. Right. We really do. I think we have to understand that if we trust in the Lord, you know, I read a, a, a survey about the food supply, and they said it's much greater now than it was, I think, in the 18th century. Some, uh, somebody was, was very upset over population explosion way back there. And, and the food has, has oh, multiplied. Okay. It, it's a power struggle. This one, call, this one uh, uh, talk I listened to, I just listened to a minute. I couldn't take it anymore. She said, uh, when women get power, we will control population. <laughs> well, sweetheart, so far you've made a mess out of the whole world. <laughs> and if anybody would have told me any of this would have happened 20 years ago, well, I said they're nuts. <sighs> we have obligations in our life. The church provides for those. But we have to trust in the Lord. I think I told you the time I went by train. I think it was from Chicago to Wisconsin. And, and, and we rode miles very fast. And I saw nothing but wheat. Wheat. Miles of wheat. We could feed the world from this country. So I, I'm, I think you're, you're right. Trust in God is what's like. But if we don't believe in God, we don't trust in God. We only believe in ourselves today. We have another call. Hello? Hi, Mother Angelica. And where are you from? Middletown, New York. And what is your question? First, I just want to say, praise God, this is the fourth time I've gotten on your program. And I love you. Thank um, you. My question is, um, recently I've encountered um, people that have kind of attacked me, saying that um, there's no such thing as truth, only belief. And that <laughs> as, a, as a Catholic, I have no right to say that um, we are the true church. And I can't say that everything is true in the Bible because we did not live during those times. And I realized talking to these people that they really didn't have a lot of faith, so I didn't know how to respond. I just said that I, I love them and I would pray for them but I wanted to know your reaction in, in a better way that I could educate these people. <sighs> you can't believe anybody thinking there's no such thing as truth. You have a hard time in a court of law. Uh, I don't know where he came from. Where did that person come from, I wonder? Is he a college buddy? Sounds like he's educated beyond his intelligence. <laughs> Isn't that true? There's no truth. I, I can't. 
Oh, Jesus, very true. <laughs> there's, there's awesome truths. See, awesome truths. You, you can everywhere, you, there's truths in nature. They are, in fact, there are truths so accurate, like um, my calendar now, I got a 1995 calendar. I don't know why I got it. I'm having enough trouble with 94. Um, but it tells me up to December 95 when the sun is going to rise. That's how accurate God's nature is. That's a truth. There are truths in the universe. See, that's what bugged all the astronomers about Jupiter. Nothing ha they happened the way they thought it was, but they were surprised it happened. <laughs> now, how do you like that? <laughs> They're drinking champagne because what they thought happened, what happened. It shows how unsure they are on a general level, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's happening. They weren't sure. See? There are truths everywhere. You, you hit a truth everywhere you go. There's air. I don't see the air, but I know if you shut it off, I can't breathe. That's a truth. It's a natural truth. I think what he's talking about is supernatural truths. But what makes you different than a monkey? Well, maybe there isn't much different. I mean, <laughs> That came out before I knew it. You know, it just. <laughs> See? See, a brain surgeon can say, if I touch this part of your brain, this is where you remember, and this, but he can't explain it. You can't. He can tell you how it works and why and what'll happen if this happens, but he can't explain it. It's a mystery. See? God's human truth, even you can't explain fully. You can't hardly explain fully. Electricity, you can tell me how. But there's a lot of knowledge. A physicist could come here and even create a few little uh, electrical things. But there are truths. A biologist, a physicist couldn't live without truth. Now, you may not know why this and this go together and make something else, but it's a truth. Nature is so exact. Remember the watch I told you about? There must be a supreme being for everything to go so well, so well and so accurate that I can tell the time and I can tell when the sun's going to rise and set, when there's a new moon, a half moon, a quarter moon, the next 20 years. Now you talk about supernatural truth. That takes faith. Faith. And that's faith is a gift from God. See? It's a shame to go your entire life and never know there is a God or a God that loves you. A God that's so close that Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Wow. Wow. You say, oh, Mother, do you believe that? Oh, it's more than belief. Faith has to come, and then I accept it. That's belief. See, if I don't accept faith, if I don't accept the laws of faith, if I don't accept the gift of faith, belief doesn't come before faith. Belief comes after faith. So he's wrong. I must have faith to believe. It would be stupid for me to say, I don't believe astronauts walked on the moon. It was really the Sahara Desert.
they made up this big plain and they in the Sahara Desert and they had a couple big, uh, big holes here and there and they got these big suits on and they walked, walked, walked and they drove and they, they put back up. <laughs> it was all the Sahara Desert. Now that's, if somebody came and said, looked at those pictures, we just all saw them how many months ago. And you did not, you didn't believe. Somebody didn't tell you what happened. That's where faith comes in. I believe. Now, I, why would I not believe that? Why would I think something so stupid that it's a Sahara Desert? There are truths, that supernatural truths take a gift from God. I would pray for that man that he receives that gift. And you know, sometimes baptism, like we went over that last week. Baptism is what gives you faith, hope, and love. And that, as you develop, and your parents teach you about God, and teach you the love of God, and the compassion of God, and the goodness of God, and the mercy of God when you goof up, and when the, the actual grace of the moment so you can, you can control yourself, you can resist temptation. You can receive the Eucharist. Oh, what a wonder. What a wonder that is, huh? What a wonder that is. So, you see, you, you have to have a gift of faith. That seed is planted in baptism. And as you grow, you begin to what? Exercise it. You begin to exercise. Your mother says, oh, that's Jesus <coughs> made that plant. You say, oh, really? Yeah. Just for you. And who's Jesus? Jesus is Son of God. Oh. See, the faith was planted, and now you have an opportunity to put that faith into action. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So, my beautiful friend who had that abortion and is so sorry, you have the faith to know you are forgiven. This man that does thinks his faith is only beliefs, I now believe you have to stop at a red light. But somebody had to tell me before I knew. Faith is that gift from God that gives you a sense of his existence, his divinity, his power, his goodness, and his love for you. And then you begin to exercise that faith. You begin to praise him for his nature. And we have a church. We began this time together saying God is bound by justice to give me a vehicle of truth. That truth is in his church. And he's given us always a vicar, a vicar of Christ to explain throughout the centuries the truth, and how it applies to our daily life. I shall be judged by God by that truth. If I have never had the opportunity, he will judge me by the light I have. But if you've had the light and you reject it, we need to pray. Let us not lose hope. God is in his heaven. And one day, somehow, he will make all things right. And the church and the truth that you despise and push away, and the vicar you treat as if he were kind of uh, not all there, not, uh, not informed, will one day stand in all his glory in the kingdom of God. And you shall know the truth. God bless you.
to order this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store, log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. Hello, family. I'm here in Rome, where our EWTN Vatican Bureau works year-round to bring you and millions around the world the latest news from the Universal Church, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. With more than 35 multilingual employees from different countries, the EWTN Vatican Bureau is the largest media organization accredited to the Holy See. Our journalists have come to EWTN from a prestigious list of well-known global outlets, including the BBC, ABC, and the Wall Street Journal, just to name a few. From covering the Pope to telling inspiring stories of faith and courage, the EWTN Vatican Bureau signature TV magazine, Vaticano, gives you and our global audience a front row seat at the heart of the Universal Church. This is only possible with your help. We don't receive funding from the church or advertisers. This network is truly brought to you by you. Today, I hope that you'll make a donation and help us continue sharing news from Rome and around the world. Thank you, and may God bless you. EWTN is 100% viewer supported. Please consider a gift today. Go to EWTN.com slash help today. You may also call us at 1-800-447-EWTN or send your donation to EWTN, 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. For more than 150 years, Catholics in the USA have placed their lives, hopes, dreams, and concerns under the special patronage of Mary, the Mother of God. Now, more than ever, we need to join together to turn to her in prayer through the Holy Rosary, to ask for healing in our church. To aid this effort, we are pleased to be offering a unique rosary from Gorelli, featuring a special crucifix with red and blue enamel stars and stripes on the front and one nation under God on the back. On the center is an image of Our Lady over a map of the United States with Psalm 3312 on the back. Every Hail Mary bead has each state's individual abbreviation on it. This collector rosary is available now at EWTNRC.com for just $36. To order, go to EWTNRC.com and search for item number 19183. The Blessed is the Nation Rosary for America. Order yours today. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, Jesus showed himself to his apostles. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. John chapter 20, verses 19, 22, and 23. God bless you. I am taking away all you have. Why don't you curse me? How can I curse you when God loves you? In India, nothing is clear. This is a difficult country. Hindus against Muslims. Muslim law against Gandhi. India is breaking up. Leave immediately and don't come back. She's either mad or a saint. Jesus has taken my hand, and I must follow him to the end. That's part one of Mother Teresa, here on EWTN. You think you believe in God until you get tested. I was born in Rwanda, and the genocide happened in 1994. Everyone in my family have been killed. 
I remember going through the Ten Commandments. I'm like, I can do this. This is not so hard. And then I started to open more pages in the Bible. It felt like every single page was talking about this. Love your enemies. I'm like, no, 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 close that page. You don't know my enemies. And after five minutes, I feel like a giant hand of God was holding me tight. And it is up to you how to you choose to live your life. Be hateful or be loving. And there is so much freedom, so much joy to be able to let go of the anger and live free the gift of this life. And if I can forgive in my situation, anyone can forgive. Well, how's my doubting Thomas? I don't want to argue with you this time. No, I'm, right. I'm just curious. You said at the end of class yesterday that if a person understands something like plumbing or shipbuilding or anything like that, he will have a good start on philosophical ethics. Well, I work with my father who does plumbing. Does that mean I can become a good moral philosopher? You're right. Yes, good question. You're already getting there, Thomas. You're already getting there, see. See, uh, well, here, let, let, let's go through an example to show you why you, you're getting there. Supposing some, uh, well, you call someone. You can't do it yourself. So you call someone to fix the toilet. He comes in. He supposedly fixes it. He leaves. And after he leaves, the toilet overfloods all over the bathroom again. All right, so you're a little upset now. You call the... Uh, plumber and uh, maybe more elegantly put, but you say he did a lousy job, come on back and fix it. All right, now suppose that our plumber uh, had some philosophy in college and uh, he's a sophisticated plumber. So he says, well, maybe from your viewpoint it's a bad, lousy job, but from my viewpoint it's a good job. Uh, I'm making 100000 a year and I got a I'm full of references. So, all right, so from your viewpoint, I can sympathize with it. It's a bad job, but from my viewpoint, it's a good job. Well, what would you think of that? Well, you say it's ridiculous. Well, it is ridiculous, too. Plumbers are realistic fellows, and they're not going to talk like that. But the interesting thing is, people will talk that way about morals, as if there's a different rule for them, as if morals don't pertain to life. See, but uh, Plato, the old pagans, Aristotle, said morals do pertain to life. So that's why they had philosophy, and that's why they say you could work it by reason. But before they set people up to talk about philosophy, morals, they talked about plumbers, Farmers, soldiers, doctors, they go through a routine. What's the goal of a teacher? Teach truth. What's the goal of a, sh of a shipbuilder? Build a ship. What's the goal of a captain? Guide the ship. Every art of profession has its goal, so they kept pushing that principle. Now, why were they pushing that principle? Well, because it works this way. If the goal of a plumber is to fix the toilet, all right, that serves as the objective standard by which you can judge the success of his work. So if the goal is here, and then he performs an activity here, then you take the standard, did he reach the goal? If he did, it's a good job. If he didn't, it's a lousy job. The goal of the activity in question determines the objective standard. And then you have an objective standard if the work is successful, is good, not a matter of opinion, not a matter of debate. If the activity reaches the standard, it's good. If the activity falls short of the standard, it's bad. See, now, we don't care if the plumber's a saint, if the plumber is a good man and a good father. We're not talking about that. We're talking about his art or his craft. And as far as the standard or goal of that craft is concerned, 
not a very good plumber. So do you see how from ordinary experience, plumbers, farmers, you get the principle, see? Aristotle was setting us up to get the principles, and the principle is if you're going to talk about human actions, and you're looking for an objective standard, you look to the goal of the activity in question, the goal is the objective standard. Now, people are realistic enough about plumbing and farming and all that to police themselves. Now, you don't have a lot of relativistic nonsense talked about in that realm. People take the uh, practical arts very seriously. It makes sense. But what about life in general? Is there a way to tell a good life from a bad life, a good man from a bad one? I mean, an objective way. There's the big question. I mean, life is the biggest activity of all. Does it have a goal? like plumbing has a goal that everybody agrees on. If it does, then you have an objective standard. If it doesn't, philosophers might as well hang it up. If there's no objective standard, then morals are simply a matter of opinion. Since everybody has their own opinion, there's no science. Now, Aristotle said, morals is a science. And that means then he had to establish that man as such, not man just as plumber, not man just as farmer or soldier, man as such has an end of goal. And that's why if you have a respect for objectivity, Thomas, uh, which you've att attained in plumbing, all right, you're ready then to deal with the objectivity of human life. You have the principle. You have an appreciation for it. You know that if you're going to be a moral philosopher, you've got to establish that man has a goal or end. That's your objective standard. On that proposition rests the possibility of being a moral philosopher. So, Next time I see you in class, now I want you to come back. Uh, what standard does Aristotle propose as a standard or goal for the lives of all men? Now, I'll give you a hint. You just check in the beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics. And come back and tell me what Aristotle says is the highest goal and what you think of it. So, Thomas, uh, that, that's your introduction to being a moral philosopher now. Okay, see you tomorrow then. Take it easy, Thomas. Mm -hmm.